on the Hill on Ponton podcast, and I'm lucky to have Shannon with me today. Hi, Shannon, girl. hey Shannon, how are you? Good. Shannon has been with us for years and is a great VA attorney. I learn so much from her every day, so I'm really excited because I'm going to have her answer the questions so that I can learn along with you. So, and for those of you who are wondering if my neighbor is going to start singing the Star Spaniel Banner outside my window like they did last week. To tell you, I don't know, but anything can happen. So stay tuned. What's our first question, Nate? What are three questions? On TDIU form 21, that's 8940, they ask what ser ser service connected disabilities prevent you from securing or following any substantially gainful occupation? Do the disabilities you list there need to add up to? 60% for one disability, 70 for multiple, with one being 40, in order to qualify. Hypothetical example, you have three disabilities that are rated at 40, 30, and 20, but only the 20% one prevents you from working, and that's what you list on question B. Would you still qualify? Under 38 CFR, Matt loves these, 4.16 little a, because of your combined rating is 70. Shannon? Yes. So what you list on the 8940 form needs to be, if possible, your service-connected conditions. But if there's only one that's keeping you from working, you can just list that one if you want to. I And sometimes that's beneficial to have it service-connected or have the IU associated with just one disability, but it's really not going to hurt you as long as your conditions are service-connected. Now, if you're not service-connected for anything yet, and you are working on that and just filing the 8940 as part of that process, I would list the ones that you are trying to get service connected. But um, as far as do, you, do they have to be the right percentages? No, just list the ones that are service connected for you though. So um, it, if, if only one 20% disability is listed, that doesn't mean they're not gonna consider the others. Right. And remember, uh, like Shannon says, you want to list all the ones that even some that you may not be service connected for now. And remember also, sometimes these ratings are combined. Say you have a back injury that has also caused radiculopathy. They're probably going to combine the 40 percent for the back, the 20 percent for each leg. And that might get you over the basic 40 percent rating for one thing. So right. I would put everything down your service connected for, and then talk about the problems that keep you from working. If you are on unemployability, can you still file claims to try and get a scheduler rating up to 100%? The answer is yes, but what do you think, Shannon? So yes, um, however, I do have a caveat to that. Caveat to that. Um, if you're unemployable already and you're not working and you're not planning to go back to work, I don't know that I would do that because sometimes I am of the opinion that once your rating is correct, I don't want the VA looking at your file anymore. So sometimes I would recommend you not do that. If you are planning to go back to work and, and you're trying to get your ratings up, that's an option for you. You absolutely can do it. It's just whether you should do it sometimes. So basically, what benefit is this going to give you? In other words, why do you need a 100% uh, scheduler? If you're already getting the benefits you're entitled to, you get permanent and total benefits, why would you want this 100% unless you're working on, like Shannon says, going back to work or right. special monthly compensation? Don't poke the bear. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. If you are receiving a pension from something other than your VA disability, can you still file for unemployability? Um, so I'm not sure what kind of pension we're talking about, but if it's a pension from something non-VA related, like it's not a non-service connected pension, yes, you can. Right. Pension income doesn't count as employability income. Right. The, what they count is money is something you're actually working in order to obtain. So say you have stocks and you get dividends or interest, you're not working for that. Or if you've earned a pension from 30 years working for a company, that's not current earnings. So yes, you can still file for unemployability. The VA forced me to switch to a new clinic location with a new primary care physician. I have seen him twice, and each time his post-it notes start with a statement, this veteran has no complaints when I am clearly 
there to address chronic issues diagnosed by the VA and have made no, no such statement. He clearly does not listen to me, and after my first visit, I made a correction to my blue button file notes. He replied that he only has 30 minutes to give me, and he cannot address my concerns. Is this something that can impact my current disability and my pending claims? I would say it along with your health. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't really know the best way to, I mean, you, you can try to get a different primary care. You can also see the patient advocate at the hospital and see if they can help you. They may be able to do something about switching your doctor or helping you with this doctor. I, I, I don't have any real good advice on that, but I, yes, you definitely, I think, want to do something about that. Immediately, I think you want to get another doctor. And if you ask for one and they don't give you, my advice has always been go to the person that can give you what you want. If you're going to be asking the nurse or the receptionist or some or the scheduler and they say, no, maybe they don't have the ability to, I think you should go to the head of whatever VA you go to, medical center, and say, I want to talk to the director. They are not going to let you, but the director's assistant is probably going to be directed to take care of you so that the director doesn't have to talk to you. And I think you need to make it very plain this doctor is not listening to me. I want a doctor who takes care of me. I am worried about my health. If this doctor is not taking care of me, what can be happening to me that I don't know about? And I think you'll get, I'll get what, you'll get what you deserve is a new doctor. I'm currently at 60% combined from all Agent Orange exposures in Thailand, 30 for my kidney, 20 for diabetes, 20 for prostate, and zero for hypertension. My doctor gave me a nexus letter for left ventricular hypertrophy as secondary to hypertension and bilateral peripheral neuropathy as secondary to diabetes. I'm using CT, EKG, and echosonogram reports and a nexus letter from my doctor as my evidence. What kind of rating could I get? And also, can my wife attend the CMP to let the examiner know how out of breath I get with physical activities like bending over, lifting things, short walks, and having to talk, a take a couple of naps a day? Could I be eligible for unemployability? I'm retired in 71. These are a lot of questions. Would you go back, Nate? I want to see his rating, is that for coronary artery disease? No. Uh, no, he doesn't have any for heart already. Okay, great. So let's get to the, will you go back to the questions? Next, what kind oh. of rating could I get? Okay, it sounds like he, he's like one to three mets if he gets short of breath from just bending over. Right, right. The, the heart's completely based on your METs and the level of activity that causes cardiac symptoms. So if you're having um, shortness of breath with that little level of activity, that could be 100%, it could at least 60, uh, but I, I would that might be 100% on its own. Um, if it's not, um, let's see, also can my wife attend my CMP exam? Yes, your wife can attend the CMP exam and you. I would insist on that if, if she's the person that needs to talk about how things are affecting you. And the last part of the question I think was unemployability. And if for some reason those combined disabilities don't get you up to a hundred, um, yes, you are eligible for TDIU. And I would absolutely recommend applying for that as a backup, even while you're working on trying to get the hundred. Right. Anybody who has physical problems like this, you should be, and they're not working, file for unemployability, please, please. We. You know, it's so important. I want to go back to the heart. Um, it sounds like your doctor is really trying to help you. And one of the things that can really help you if your doctor is willing to try is a disability benefits questionnaire. There's a cardiac one. And Nate, if you would put that up, this is something that you should take to your doctor and ask them to complete. There's a question on there about the METs. Because of your heart, what are you limited to in regard to METs, okay? And if your doctor could fill that out, and I would assume you would get one to three, I think that could be excellent evidence in your case. I would also like to talk about can your wife or anyone go to the CMP exam? This is something that is really infuriating. The answer is yes. The only reason somebody else is not allowed there is because there's a right of privacy, your right of privacy. So if they say she can't come in, you need to say it's my right of privacy and I'm waiving it for her. If they still say, you say, I'm not going in without her and sit there and they will let her in. 
You need to be that way with these people. Otherwise, they're going to push you around. And she needs to have a chance to speak. A lot of times they don't want that either. And you say, this is part of my exam. And if you don't let her speak, then I'm going to write to the VA and let them know what happened here. Anything you'd add, Shannon? No, I think that's absolutely correct. And and they will say no. Uh, yes. Very often they will try to tell you that you're not allowed to bring anyone in, like Carol said, based on HIPAA. And that's just not applicable. Right. And it used to be when your exam was through the VA, a lot of times they would say, oh, I don't care. But now your exams are through private companies that make money from this and they don't want to lose that money. So if it's your wife comes in or she doesn't and you lose money, they're going to let your wife in. Nate? I am 70% and still dependent to an active and it's still a dependent to an active duty service member, so my primary care is still done through TRICARE at military facilities. Are there any reasons to also alternatively be seen at the VA? What do you think, Shannon? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, the, you're, if you're being seen at military facilities, they still are gonna, those uh, records are pretty much available to us, just like through the VA. Uh, and you don't need VA care in order to get VA benefits. They're just, I find that that's a really easy way to get all the uh, records in one place. So that's, you know, it's it's nice to have them documented and VA can get those, but they can also get the military facilities records. So um, I, I don't think there's an advantage unless you're gonna get better care. There, those are the two things I say. First of all, I don't care who your doctor is. Are you reading those medical records and are they accurate? Are they talking about your complaints, your symptoms? If they're not, you need to get another doctor. And second, if your problems are not addressed, this is a health issue and you need, I just had a client diagnosed with terminal cancer of the liver and he had had problems with his liver and the doctor just never bothered to investigate over the last three years. Don't let that happen to you, please. Next question. Going for a second compensation and pension exam for heart valve replacement and bypass from Camp Lejeune Water, cause I'm 40% now for loss of use of foot or obesity and anxiety, any wisdom? I'm not quite sure what that question is. I have sleep apnea diagnosed by VA, a CPAP machine, and anxiety and depression by the VA test. Should I bring all of that stuff with, to, with my CMP examiner? Can you go back to the first question, first part of that? Going for a second CMP for heart valve replacement and bypass. 40% now for loss of use of foot or obesity and anxiety. Any wisdom? I'm not, are you, I'm unclear about what that question is saying. Do you? Understand, Shannon? I don't, and I'm not sure, like the 40% rating for anxiety or foot, I, I'm not sure what that means. If you, I, what I can say from this question, if you're asking, um, should you bring all these different disabilities up with the CMP examiner, it's not gonna hurt, but if it's not relevant to what he's actually examining for you for, he's probably not gonna be interested or write it down. Exactly. Um, if you're saying that you're service connected for your foot and you're wanting to know about filing a claim for anxiety and depression, if your physical conditions are causing you to have uh, you know, a chronic pain disorder you're, where you're depressed because of the pain, then absolutely file that it's a secondary condition. I, I hope we answered that, but I'm not sure what the question was exactly. And I'm sorry, I, I'm not either. So if you wanna rephrase that a little bit to, to get to the questions we didn't answer, Maybe uh, Nate can find that and pull that up, okay? One of two, Iraq, 3rd Infantry, out for 20 years before diagnosed, torn rotator cuff, torn elbow, bulged disc in cervical spine, bulged disc in lower back, spinal stenosis, and radiculopathy. What do I need besides diagnosis, buddy letter, and a nexus? I fell and complained in the service, but it's not like they had an MRI, so I dealt with it all these years. I couldn't handle it anymore. Can I prove plantar's fasciitis is service-connected after being out of the infantry for 20 years? Shannon, what would you do with this? So it's hard. I, I would recommend if you're not already in treatment, start getting treated as soon as you can. Um, if there's anybody, family members, friends, you mentioned a buddy statement. If you can get somebody who remembers when you were injured, remembers when you fell, um, that'll help. 
if they if they documented the fall but didn't do an MRI, that's okay. Um, as long as the, the injury is documented, you're you know, that gives you a place to start. The, these claims are hard when there's a big gap. So try to make the gap as small as possible, filling it in with any medical records that you did get in the meantime, any treatment you did get, um, filling in with a buddy statement from, you know, someone that knows what happened, someone that knows you when you got out and you were still having these problems, um, you know, that can fill in the gap over the years. They're hard, but it's, it's not impossible to do this. So what you have to prove is what they call chronicity. That means that something started in the service and it has continued to date. So normally people would prove that with medical records, but because there's been such a gap, that's going to be difficult. So you might want to write a statement on your own. This is what happened. This is what I felt in the service. It has continued. I had treatment with a chiropractor. You can list all the things you had or I just suffered. Those records are no longer available. The records that I have start with this date, but this problem has continued. And then you would want, as Shannon said, statements from anybody who was there at the time or anybody who has known you over the years that can say they have continued. The, the regional office is probably not going to approve you, but you can win at the board. So make sure these statements are complete. The board is the first place that I see where they're actually reading these. And we win a lot of these cases, but you have to document it really right. well. I just received service connection for hypertension at 0%. I've been on meds for over 20 years and have no medical records pre-med to show a predominantly over 100 diastolic. How do I show support for a 10% rating? I'm not sure that you can. Um, if, if the hypertension rating is, is based on the numbers. And so if there's no record showing that you ever met the 10% criteria without the medication, I don't know that you'll be able to show that. Um, I would always say with hypertension, look at the secondary conditions because hypertension causes so many other things. It causes, a, if you've had a stroke, if you've had, um, th there, chronic kidney disease is often caused by hypertension. So look at your other conditions, talk to your doctor, ask, are any of these things due to my hypertension? Because chances are some of them are. Right. As Matt says, it's a gateway disease. So you could have had a stroke, you could have heart disease. There's so many things that hypertension causes. So you need to look at your diagnosis of the, the problems you have and see if these are service connect, these are related to hypertension and make sure you get credit for those. Those are the ones that usually give you the ratings that you're looking for. Hello guys, I received 0% for chronic epididymitis. Did I say that right? Ooh, I don't know. I can read them sometimes, but don't ask me to pronounce some of those. Is there any secondary related? Um, do you know what CE stands I don't. for? I'm thinking it's service condition. I don't know. I don't actually. I don't have an answer for this one. I'm not really sure. Not that I know of. I'm but not that doesn't either. mean anything. Talk to your doctor. Right. Exactly. My husband's psychiatrist wrote a detailed independent medical opinion and requested service connection um, as special monthly compensation um, T due to his diagnosis, many, and laid out aid and attendance needs that I have helped him with since 2007. Will the VA accept a DBQ from a psychologist, a PhD, for service-connected combat PTSD and TBI? Mixed answers. Is an independent medical exam sufficient on its own? Uh, so they're going to give him their own exam always, even though, yes, it is sufficient. Um, whether they're going to take that and, and rely on that is no, they're, they're, they are probably going to ask you for a CMP exam too. And I'm of the opinion, if they order a CMP exam, I recommend to all my veterans go show up for what Absolutely. they say for, because, uh, they will, they will use any excuse to deny you and not showing up for a CMP exam is a, is a specialty. So, um, you, yes. Let's see. The first part of the question was, could you use a, a psychologist, I think, for that? You can. Um, I, TBI, you might want uh, neuropsych. Uh, right. That would probably be a better opinion. Um, if you have, you know, whoever's treating him for that is probably the best person to give that opinion for you. But um, I think they have to accept it, whether they give it as much credibility as they might give a neuropsychiatrist or something like that, probably not as much credit. Right. I think you really want to try to get a neurologist or a neuropsychologist. 
Remember, the prop SMCT is really hard to get because that pays like ten thousand three hundred dollars a month. Right. And so the, the we see very few of those approved anywhere except at the board, and sometimes you have to go to the court. But you, they say a neurologist is important in order to diagnose this. So you may want a neuropsychologist, as Shannon said, or you may want an actual neurologist. The problem is the VA doesn't give the actual testing for this. They give what I call a, a sample. Do you have a problem socially? Do you have a problem with this? I mean, it's like 10 questions, you know, exam over. That is not what we're talking about for an evaluation. The neuropsychologists give a very extensive three-hour, very detailed exam, and that's what you need in order to prove this. Plus, I would have lots of statements from people talking about the TBI and how it affects your activities of daily living, giving examples, not saying this is a good person, not saying I really like him, not saying this person deserves it, say this person can't find his car when he walks out the front door and it's sitting in the driveway, or this person... Um, has worked has um, has been unable to understand what medications he's supposed to take. He's taken too many medications and overdosed. I mean, show the examples. That's what what really gets the attention of the BVA and the VA. Because it's the TBI that's required for the SMCT. The right. the PTSD does not get you SMCT. It can get you aid in attendance, but it can't get you all the way to T. So you would need um, you need the TBI to be related to the need for aid and attendance. Yes. Have you heard of helpless child benefits? And do we need to turn that with the claim? Do we need to turn it in with the claim? Separate mixed answers on that as well. Shannon. So helpless child is is a dependent benefit, and yes, you can file it with your claim. Um, it, it's it's not going to be specific to a certain claim that you have for service connection or for increased rating. It's more it, it's it is separate, but you can file it together. So when our clients file a claim and they have dependents, we like them to file a 686 C. Is that 686 C form, and that lists all the dependents. Uh, and that gets that done for you right away so that when you get at least a 30% rating, those dependents are starting getting paid right away. The problem with a helpless child is you have to show that they were totally disabled before they turned 18. So you want to make sure that you have to prove that to the VA. So you want to get that evidence in right away so that they have that. Now remember, what's really important to know is if you die, that child is entitled to a VA dependent benefit all on their own. So if you leave a widow, they're entitled to a benefit, but that helpless child is also entitled to a benefit, which is significant. So you want to have that proven. You don't want to have to prove 30 years after you started getting benefits that this child is helpless. Okay, that you don't want to be in that position. So get the 686C form, see what you need to prove that this child is has been disabled since age 18. Sometimes you need um, psychology records that show their IQ. Um, you have maybe psychological records, anything that shows that before they turned 18 and get that in, get that settled with the VA. VES seems to be, okay, so there are three companies that do compensation and pension exams, QTC, VES, and then there's another one that keeps changing their name because I think they're calling themselves Optimum now because they're so awful. <laughs> yeah, if you change your name enough, you can't be tracked down, I guess, is their thought. <laughs> yes. And so it says they seem to be slow in getting CPS results to the VA. Is there a specific time VA requires for these vendors to submit their reports? No. Not that I, they're supposed to, but I have seen them months later still trying to get a report. How about you, Shannon? They're usually fairly quickly. I mean, I, I very often see them come in there within a few days, but sometimes they don't. And there doesn't seem to be anything we can do about that except wait and keep pushing. Where is it? Where is it? But it's it, there's not yes. a whole lot you can do if it takes them a while to turn those in. Exactly. Upon discharge, I claimed right arm injuries due to parachuting. The VA granted 10% elbow, 30% forearm, 10% risk, but denied any rating for my thumb. Back then, I had nothing visible on my thumb, but everything 
I do with my thumb is at weird angles such that now I have swelling visible that is hard to touch, stiffness with painful and limited range of motion, and most importantly, I have medical documents and photos showing this. I'm hoping for at least a 10% thumb rating, but don't need it to reach 100%. I'm already permanent in total, but the 10% would explain my difficulties with the activities of daily living for aid and attendance and the family caregiver program. I can't button buttons, tie ties, adjust orthopedic devices. On August 4th, I called in an attempt to file. My question is, should I refer to this as a new claim or an appeal of the discharge denial? How when, long ago when, was the discharge? 30 years? Is that what it said? Well, did he tell us? That was on the... F yeah, he didn't tell us. There's a good question. If it's okay. within a year... Well, yeah, so if if you claimed right arm injuries and the thumb was talked about back then, you need a supplemental claim now. It's not necessarily appeal, but it's a supplemental claim to reopen something. If the thumb has never been talked about before, then it's a new claim and you need a 526. Right. But as I always tell you, whatever form you file, if they tell you it's the wrong one, just file the other one. I mean, why fight I, with them? I agree. Yeah? You want your case to move. You don't want to be right and sit there for a year. Okay. Uh, oh, great. Sending in pictures, I find, is incredibly impressive to the VA. I think I told y'all before, I had a veteran who had, because of skin cancer, part of his nose had been cut off and he was getting a 30% rating. I sent in a picture and without a CNP exam or anything, they knocked him right up to 80%. So pictures are incredibly important. Make sure that you have, and don't take a bad picture. Take a picture until you get an accurate picture of what your thumb looks like and send that in. But you need to put it on a form. They used to be 4138. Now, do you remember what they're called? They're uh, 2102 two or something. Nate, if you can put up the form. Oh, the that aid attendance form? No, the or? form when you identify what you're uh, submitting. So this is a picture of my right thumb. Oh. And you need right. a form so that you can identify that. And they then they have proof that this is you sworn under oath saying it's your right thumb. When you sign these forms, I know the old one, VA 21 slash 4138, use that if you can't find the new one. Right. And say, this is a picture of my thumb. It has been looking like this since whatever it came from the parachute landing on this date. Packed act claim, rhinitis, sinusitis, current chronic diagnosis, including MRI and cyst, in-service treatment records for rhinitis, but unfavorable CMP exam. Can it still be approved and service-connected disability granted? Yes. <laughs> yes, it can. Um, this, yeah. File it with the, with the records. They probably already have the records, but you can attach them anyway and just point out. I, I would appeal that decision. If they if they've denied it now, just because you got an unfavorable CMP exam doesn't mean they're going to deny it. Um, but it's pretty it, likely. It, <laughs> fair, <laughs> that's fair. Um, but if you know, wait for the decision. Um, you can also you know uh, send in a letter, a statement pointing out that you still have this problem that you had it in service, that it's in your service medical records, and maybe head off the decision if it hasn't been made yet, and you already know the CMP was unfavorable. You definitely want, if the CMP is not accurate, if it's not complete, you need to immediately send a letter into the VA once again on this 4138 or whatever the new form is, because that form says you've sweared to the foregoing. On this date, I had a CMP exam. This is what they did. This is what they didn't do. This is what they said that is totally inaccurate. I said this for some reason they wrote this down. This is something I told them. They didn't bother to write it down. This is your chance to explain before they make a decision why they should not rely on that. If they deny you, you want to immediately file a higher level review. And one of the things you want to argue is failure to consider all evidence that was favorable in your case. Okay, that is a biggie. And I find that I'm getting a lot more reversals on higher level reviews when I point out here's the favorable evidence that was never considered. Therefore, relying on the CMP exam was was error. Okay, they didn't consider the whole file. Anything you'd add to that, Shannon? No, I, I think that's a, a great point is when you're filing a higher, higher level review appeal, go ahead and tell them why. You don't yeah. have to, you know, if you make them guess, they're going to say, I don't see anything. Yeah. So go ahead and tell them what the problem is and why they messed up. Exactly. 
And you might have, I've, I've been really impressed lately with, they are actually reading some of these. They're reading yeah. them. Yeah. I had my claim at the appeals board level for two years, and then I received a proposal from the VA called RAP to speed up the process. I couldn't get answers from VSO, so I accepted it, and the VA denied my claim. I don't like the VA. That was RAMP, not RAMP. Okay. Oh, RAMP. yeah. Okay. Ever since the denial, it's as if the VA automatically rejects it without any consideration, even with new evidence. There's no consideration. What gives? That's asking us to think about the VA, how they think, or uh, not. I don't think at all. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's if you're not getting any traction at the regional office, you can go back to the board. Be aware that it's taking three or more, three or four years to get any kind of decision from them. It's, you know, I keep hoping okay, that it's a lot longer. I have cases from 2017 sitting there. I am so wow. furious. Yeah. That's, if you don't have a way to expedite and you're filing under this new AMA system to the board, you're going to be sitting there forever. I, okay. That's why we now, we didn't used to stay at the regional office because the board gave us better decisions. Now I'm staying unless my client is 75, terminal, something right. that I know can get this case moved. Yeah, I it's, think, it's go ahead. been a mess. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. You said, I think. <laughs> I think in this case, I would file um, an 0995, a new claim. I would submit a new evidence and I would talk about the new evidence since the denial. Okay, to point out, this isn't the same claim that was filed before because there's new evidence to support my disability um, and see if that can get their attention. I was hoping for a little guidance. I'm 70% PTSD according to my most re recent rating. I recently got a vocational opinion and my question is, would I appeal the 70% raising rating or use my intent to file? Appeal appeal your 70% rating and then, it, because if you do that, then your IU can attach all the way back to the effective date of that 70%. If you use the intent to file and file a new claim for unemployability, you're starting then. So you definitely want to appeal. Absolutely. When a veteran turns 75 years old or they have a fatal disease in the last stages or both, does the VA advance their pending claim and give their decision? So at the board, 75 is the correct age for an expedite. At the regional office, was it, what are they saying now? 85. 80, it's 85. 85. That's ridiculous, but that's what they're saying. So at the board, you can expedite at 75. If you have a terminal condition, you can expedite either place. You can also expedite um, for homelessness. Those are the only ones I really see doing much. The, yep. There are financial expedites as well, but I'm, I don't see much traction on those. Well, I know if you have a purple heart, they're supposed to do that. Right. Right along, or they're supposed to do that. Uh, terminal illness. There is a form, and Nate, if you could put that up. I this is one thing the VA has done that I am really happy about. They now have a form for the regional office for expedite. And when you file that form, they are paying attention to it. So all you have to do when you fill out the form is put the reason, and the reason will be terminal illness. Uh, and they will get to that case right away compared to the way they did before. Do you know that? Right. I can't remember the n number. I, I, I'm losing the new form numbers. I have to look them up every time. But <laughs> I, I can find the form, but I don't know what the number for it is. Right. So, Nate, if you can find that and put it up either now or later, anytime you have a reason for expedite at the regional office, you want to file that. And I'm finding that they are very, for some reason, they have now really gotten on um, Purple Heart. So if you have a Purple Heart, that's a basis for expedite. And I, I'm noticing the regional office is doing that. They also are starting to talk about bankruptcy, um, Terminal illness, homelessness, utilities cut off. I'm trying to think of it. Any other? I haven't that... had. I haven't. I haven't had much success with that one. So that's good to know. Water, electricity. If they've been cut off, and so you show the bill from that, or you show the eviction, or you show the mortgage foreclosure. I'm finding they now with that form. Before, when we send those documents in, they didn't pay attention. But now with that form, I don't know what's happening. But they, we're really getting some traction on that. So use Great. the form. If you're at the board, you need to file a motion to advance on the docket, okay? And I find it's really helpful. I know that it may not be proper in a letter, but my heading says, terminal illness, please advance on, or motion to advance on the docket. Whether you're filing at the regional office or at the board, you want to get their attention. And that's, that's how you do it. Don't put it in the body, body of the letter. I mean, put it there, but put it in the heading.
Nate? During a BVA hearing, if my evidence agrees with 38 CFR of SMC that I should be awarded SMC R1 and the regional office got it gone, wrong, will you guys state the facts to the judge or the judge should know? First of all, well, what do you think, Shannon? So the judge should know, but I would absolutely state it anyway. I'm, I'm a big fan of telling the VA what you want. Um, yes. If you just send an appeal in, they, I mean, sometimes C files are thousands of pages, uh, claims files. So expecting that they are going to sift through and see what you think is important is, is not necessarily going to happen. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of always telling the VA what it is that you want them to do, make it easy for them. And why you're entitled to it. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would not have a hearing. I know that there are other people that have hearings. The only thing the judge can do in a hearing is decide your credibility. And if this judge decides you're not credible, you're not believable, that is the kiss of death for your case. The second thing is, are they still, once you have a hearing, are you still tied to that judge or under the AMA? Is that not true anymore? Before That's it was not, always true. Yeah, it, the old legacy cases are still, um, the, the board judge does the hearing if that judge is still around. But I think under yeah. AMA, it doesn't matter who does the hearing. Right. Okay. But I, I think, I don't think, you know, I know there are people that like these hearings. I don't think so. I think you need to write down exactly why you're entitled and back it up with the evidence. Cause that's, that's the only way you're going to win. You can stand on your head. You can have anybody testify for you at the hearing, but you, that's not going to win your case. It's the facts that are in writing. The only time I think you should have a hearing is if you're missing a leg and they say you're not or something like that. Um, there was another hearing that they had that was absolutely awful. The veteran had uh, what is similar to ALS, and he absolutely could not move or do anything, and he was on Zoom. That, that was granted that day. Those are the only kind that I think that are going to move somebody so much that a hearing will actually make a difference. I agree. Just if there's some reason they actually need to see you. But right. um, I, even then... If there's another way to do that, those hearings are, those, that lane is just really long. And so if there's a better, if there's another way to do it, I wouldn't be sold on, um, you know, making sure that you get a hearing because I, I don't know that the benefit of that is going to be worth the, the years that you have to spend waiting for it. Yeah, the delay is just terrible. And the BVA tells you, please don't ask for a hearing unless you absolutely need one. They're trying to tell you, you're going to be waiting for 20 years at this rate. Right. I was wondering if you have seen fibromyalgia secondary to PTSD. I don't think I have. I don't think I have either. I would Google it, see if there are any medical treatises that back that up. But frankly, I, I've never seen that. I'd like to know. If you find that, let us know. Absolutely. I mean, you've got to remember, I'm not a doctor. So if the doctor <laughs> says it is, then yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're halfway through. And um, I think that both of us as we do these cases, we're constantly seeing things that we feel are important and we want to get out to you. So Shannon, you want to start? Sure. I think um, the main thing that I, I want to tell veterans, the ones that I represent and the ones that, that I don't, a lot of times I'm asked, should I wait until this is done and then file that? Or is it going to hurt me to file all these things together? If you wait to file something, you're putting your effective date back. If you file everything now, then you get the earliest possible effective date. So I always almost, I mean, I can't think of an exception off the top of my head that I would tell you, yes, wait until this is done and then do that. Um, it's almost always the best idea to go ahead and file all of your claims as soon as you know about them and get them on the record. Even if you don't think you can win them, just go ahead and file it now, get, you know, and, and get the process started. And even if they're cases like hypertension, which has caused chronic kidney disease, file for the chronic kidney disease. That's a problem right. we're seeing. We're seeing right. people get, like the person that asked us, a 0%, which is pretty usual for hypertension. And then we say, what about the chronic kidney disease? And the VA says, well, you didn't file for it. So then you go back and then you have to fight on the effective date. So file for everything. My thing is special monthly compensation. Special, okay, so 100% for a veteran is around, a veteran alone is around $3,600, okay? 
Some veterans, and I'm saying this correctly, some veterans get $10,345 a month alone, just for them. And that's under special monthly compensation. The VA is not going to tell you about that. They're not going to help you with that. But it is one of the most important sets of laws for veterans out there. And none of my veterans are filing for it unless it's aid and attendance. Okay, so there are okay, there are a number of SMCs, and I urge you to look under special monthly compensation, and they will list the ones that are there for you. But I just want to talk about a few. One is aid and attendance. That means that if you need someone to help you with your activities of daily living because of a service-connected problem, then you should be getting aid and attendance, which is around $1,000 more a month, okay? Now, the aid and attendance used to be an inferred claim. That meant that the VA, when they saw you needed it, should evaluate it. They never did. But now it's not inferred anymore. You have to file for it. And the effective date starts the date after you filed and or were entitled to it, whichever is later. So if there are certain veterans that I know are going to need aid and attendance, if you have peripheral neuropathy or diabetes, you're going to have peripheral neuropathy. If you have Parkinson's, if you have um, MS, um, there are just so many diseases that are going to end up, unfortunately, having a great impact on your ability to do things like take pills out of a box, put the pill in your mouth, cut your food up. If you have one of these diseases, you should already be filing for aid and attendance, and there are an SMC called loss of use of feet and loss of use of hands. This does not mean that you don't have your hands or your feet anymore, but what you have lost is the basic premise of your feet. And what is that? To balance, to be able to balance and push off. I see so many veterans that continue to fall all the time breaking shoulders, getting concussions, they have lost the ability to balance. They should have filed for loss of use of feet. The other is loss of use of hands. Uh, if you have numbness and you can't pick up pills, if you can't pick up a coin, if you can't button, you have loss of use of hands. And these SMCs are the ones that were going to get you up to close to $10,000 a month. The VA hates these claims, they don't want to pay the money, and they're going to fight you tooth and nail. You're not going to win at the regional office except for, I don't know, a miracle. So you need to start these claims right away so that when you get to the board, uh, you know, you, you can get these benefits without not filing and then starting later after you're aware of all these problems. For things like loss of use of feet, loss of use of hands, they are still inferred claims and the effective date is when the claim arose, when it was clear from the records that you were entitled to this. But don't count on the VA to give you that. They like looking at the date you filed the claim. So once again, file now. If you have these diseases, file now. Any others you can think of, Shannon, that, are, that we run into all the time? Um. The only one that the only special monthly compensation that pops into my mind is one that I see so much is the S. And yes. that's if you have a hundred percent disability and you have others that add up to 60, um, it's SMCS. So yes. sometimes and and that hundred can be due to unemployability if that unemployability so if you have PTSD that's seventy percent rated, but you're unemployable due to the PTSD then the, your 100% is for the PTSD. And if you have other orthopedic conditions or something that add up to 60, then you're entitled to that special monthly compensation. A lot of times the VA gets that one right, but if they- Not if unless they, you have a 100% scheduler. Well, I have know, yet to, yeah. Right, that, yeah. If you have the, the TDIU, they, they, they will say, well, it's based on all of your disabilities and you kind of have to prove to them, no, it was based on just this one. So um, it, it's something to keep in mind when you're working on unemployability, if you can base it on just one condition, that might down the road get you more. Right. So we have told, uh, told our clients and you that a vocational report is really important. It shows why you can't work. So if you have 100% for PTSD, like Shannon said, make sure the vocational report only talks about that and does right. not include the other issues. And that way you have grounds for appeal when they don't give you SMCS. Um, I have yet to see them... When you have TDIU, they're not going to look for S. When you have a 100% scheduler, yes, sometimes. So you have to file an appeal saying that you, the failure to maximize benefits, okay, failure to consider all the favorable, failure to assist 
in that you didn't give me an exam to see if the PTSD alone causes my unemployability. Don't miss these benefits. And um, SMC is like a stepping stone. You get one and that helps you get another one. So don't think that the extra three or $500 a month is not really important for other ways as well. So that's our tip for this week. Nate, back to the questions. I filed for bilateral leg pain. VA decided it was shin splints and had a CMP for them and then denied when it was actually sciatic radiculopathy in my records. How can I correct? Shannon? Oh, I guess there's another question. Them. I have two claims. The VA is working on three conditions. Claim one, several on. Two, reach 95% with claims on. If rating remaining number one claims are granted and would have put me at 100%. Does effective date change the date of claim one? It's one and a half years earlier. You want to go back to the first question or you got that channel? I don't. No, I got the, I got the, uh, how do you fix the bilateral leg pain? And and I happen. appeal that. And if you're service connected for your back, which I'm assuming you are um, based on your question, then appeal that decision and get your doctor or, or somebody to say, they have sciatica it's in the left and the right it's and if you can get them to say moderate severe you know uh, go ahead and have them say that and and submit that with your appeal and you know you can clarify for them i wasn't claiming shin splints it's ridiculous right. but here's what my doctor says so you can just appeal that um as far as the effective date next if, one nate so if the radiculopathy or sciatica is part of the first claim and that puts you at the 100%, if your 100% goes all the way back, the, the radiculopathy claim, if that's the number one one, the effective date would go all the way back to the date of that claim. So if that's the one that moves you up to 100 and everything is the same back then, then yes, the 100 would go all the way back. It really depends on your combination of ratings and at what point you're at 100. Um, you know, when, when the, when the disabilities combine to a hundred, that's your effective date. So without knowing more about when each claim was filed and what's in each one, it's, it's hard to say that for sure. Yeah. But one thing I would say that we continue to see is we have a veteran that has been unemployed for 10 years. They've been filing these claims and they're getting 70% and 80% and 90%. And finally they give them a hundred percent scheduler as of last month. And they say the IU, the unemployability, is moot because now they have 100%. This is wrong, okay? You are entitled to unemployability back when you met the scheduler for it, which is 70% combined or 60% for one or maybe even less. Go back and fight for that. You need to file immediately an appeal saying IU is not moot. I'm entitled to IU as of whatever date you think it is, and this is the reason why. And once again, remember... I find it helpful if you allege VA failure to comply with regulations like failure to assist, failure to consider all the favorable evidence, failure to maximize benefits. Remember with SMCS, I always put the VA, there's a quote from one of the federal cases that said, when a veteran files a claim, they're always filing for the highest benefits available. And that means they should consider them whether you have mentioned SMCS or not, okay? So don't let them do that. I see that over and over and over again. I'm sure you do too, Shannon. Absolutely. They almost, if I see the word moot in a VA decision, I know they have made a mistake. There's all, yes. That's a huge red flag because they, they do it wrong every time. It just, it every feels time. like every time. I missed a CMP back in 2012 with one year, one year of getting out of the Army and everything but two issues were denied. I give up on those. What would be the best way to get those reopened? Shannon, what would you do? I would go ahead and file a supplemental claim uh, to reopen them and submit whatever evidence that you have at this point um, to, to get them reopened. You, you do technically need new evidence to reopen a claim, but that evidence can be as simple as a statement that, from you that says something that you didn't say the last time or reports that I missed my CMP exams and I'm willing to go now. Um, that can be enough. Yeah. So just, like you that. know, su submit it with some kind of new evidence, in, like a statement. The other thing I'd point out, if you miss a CMP exam, they have a right to deny you, except within a year of being discharged. 
Within a year of being discharged, if you miss a CMP exam, they have to look at the evidence that exists at the time to see if they right. can still grant that. So you need to look at those two issues which were denied for failure to attend the CMP exam and see if the evidence in your file would have allowed you to be service connected for those. So say that, that it was clear that you had those problems in service, you've been treated for them, you were talking about chronic pain in your knee and they denied that. I think those, you want to go back and file a claim, an 0995, to get it reopened, and once you get it service connected, then you want to go back and ask for that date, say that um, that under the law, they should have considered that even though you missed the CMP exam. Can write to the BVA direct lane a statement that paints a picture for the BVA. I am not trying to submit new evidence. I feel like a statement is something to support where I'm coming from, thanks. What would you do? So they are going to consider a statement as evidence. A statement from a veteran is considered evidence. The only, I mean, you could try <laughs> saying I it's wouldn't. an argument, you know, yeah. because they do have to accept arguments and they accept them from us, but usually they won't accept them from a veteran. So you can try saying it's an ev it's, it's a, it's an argument, but you can't submit, they're not going to consider anything that is facts. So if you're pointing out the law to them, go for it. If you're pointing out, you know, you you did not apply the law correctly, um, then they have to consider that. But a statement from you is probably going to be considered evidence. So remember, the BVA direct line is that you have no evidence to submit. It's based on the decision that was made. The original decision was made. Um, these are kind of scary appeals, unless it's a regular. This is all law, like Shannon said. I'm usually pretty hesitant. Um, to file those. It would be the rare case that I would take the direct line. And remember, you're going to be sitting there forever as well, um, unless you have a, a basis for expedite. Hi, good afternoon. I would like to know if it's better to claim sleep apnea as secondary to allergic rhinitis and asthma or just to one condition. What do you recommend, Shannon? I'd probably say and or <laughs> just too. when you file it secondary to allergic rhinitis and or asthma. VA, you're not a doctor. VA can't hold you to that standard. Um, you told them what you think it might be and now they can figure out what it is. Exactly. What does a regulatory and procedural review mean? And I been seeing I've seen I've been seeing a lot of this with fellow vets. Regulatory and procedural review. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Are you? I don't either. The only thing I could think that that might be is after the law changes, say, for instance, they've added hypertension with the PACT Act. It yeah. could be that they're re reviewing claims that the vets already had for hypertension that were denied. Or I, I'm not aware of them doing that, but um, I guess that's possible. That's the only thing I could think of that it might be. I well, maybe... How about with the blue water sailors? They have to go back because they are now considered in Vietnam. Right, and they look do have at, to do those. So maybe that's what you're talking about. Um, remember, if a veteran uh, was a blue water sailor and they were originally denied for not being in Vietnam, and now they are because they were within the 12-mile limit, limit, then the VA has to go back and look at all the claims that they filed sec secondary to Agent Orange, okay? And that may be what you're talking about there. Because I've seen them doing that with cases that aren't blue water cases. If you filed a claim for something that is a blue water, is, is an Agent Orange type claim, they're reopening some of them and checking and saying, "Oh, you're not blue water. Never mind." So they're they're doing a review and then they're discarding it and just denying it. So right. it, it could be something like that. I have in service records for head entry doctor nexus and buddy letter and plenty of symptoms is that enough for a tbi claim if there's a current diagnosis you know it's uh, yeah that's enough to at least get started and yeah, then, then they have to tell you if they don't like it why they don't exactly. like it so you need to show something happened in service that has caused a present day problem and that's why shannon said you need a current diagnosis i hope you have already filed your claim if you if you are if you even aren't sure what to file, file an intent to file a claim. Okay, don't don't just file nothing. Please, please file. Okay. 
On my VA records disc, I saw an old DBQ for denial of mental health conditions in 2013. The DBQ omitted three DMS IV criteria C avoidance indicators. The VHA records on the disc clearly show those missing indicators diagnosed, documented, which led me to apply for benefits in the first place. The records and pre-DBQ diagnosis were not considered ignored by the VBA. Is a Q or supplemental claim the best route? So I'd need to know more before I was So Q is pretty um, hard to get. It's it's a rare situation. And CMP exams usually don't uh, add up to Q for me. Um, I, I don't use like failure to give a CMP uh, duty to assist is not a, is not a Q error. So um, the fact that they gave you a bad exam uh, is probably not going to get you uh, to Q. However, if there are other things in the record that if they if they only consider what was in the record back then and it's very it's clear and unmistakable they should have granted it it could potentially be a q um i would go ahead and file that supplemental claim and maybe in that you could allege you also think there's q so that way you're getting the process started and then you can argue about the effective date later you know raise the issue but go ahead if, if you just file the q claim you may be missing out on starting your new one if there's um, if that Q claim isn't valid. I can't say for sure whether it is or not. So I would probably file that supplemental claim, also allege Q on there, and then you can work out the effective dates later. Right. You file an 0995 and you get that service connected, and then you argue about the date. And whether you want to put in the 0995, uh, you think that it should go back, that either one. But first, you need to get service connected then you need to file an appeal of the date, the effective date. That's, you know, the VA works in their own way. And we have found, I have found over the years, I tried to file Q claims and they didn't pay attention. I had to file an 0995. I had to get it service connected. And then I had to fight for the effective date. So that's what we'd recommend here. Please remind female veterans that female sexual arousal is equivalent to erectile dysfunction and it is SMCK. It can easily be linked to PTSD, MST, diabetes, and other conditions. Thank you so much because that is absolutely true. Okay? Um, I feel bad. It took me years to realize that and to start filing that claim. But that, that's one of the SMCs that you are entitled to, so please file for it. Thanks for your podcast. Getting 30% for heart disease, would getting a pacemaker increase or decrease that 30%? I don't think we know what kind of heart disease you're getting. What do you think, Shannon? So I, as far as I know, I, I don't think you get a higher rating or a lower rating for a pacemaker. I, I think it's still just dependent on, I'd, I'd need to go look at the diagnostic code for sure. I don't want to say that for sure, but as far as I know off the top of my head, I think it would still just be dependent on your meds. Um, and, you know, if that pacemaker improves that situation, you know, maybe your, your heart condition is improved. Um, that might lower your rating, but you would have to see an actual improvement to see a lowered, a lowered rating. I, I don't think it would increase your rating. So I'm not sure, are you getting 30% for coronary artery disease, heart disease, or are you already getting a rating for AFib, which is what you have the pacemaker for if, you, if your heart is not beating correctly? If you're not getting something for AFib already, then yes, you would get a higher rating because there is a regulation that says you're, in this case, you're entitled for a rating and payment for both coronary artery disease and AFib. And when they put the pacemaker in, I don't have the reg in front of me, but when they put the pacemaker in, there may be 100% or a certain raised um, benefit for a certain amount of time after that surgery as well. So I'm going to look that up and hopefully I'll know that next week. I yeah, I, I need to look at the diagnostic code for that. I don't know. Yes, but I definitely, first I need to know what you're getting it for right now. Um, but I think that you could get at least a temporary if you're already getting 30%. I know when you have a defibrillator put in, that's 100%. So that's a big change. If my VA psychiatrist states in the record that my depression and anxiety is caused by cancer, 
diagnosis, do I still need a nexus letter? So to me, that is the nexus and that right. provides it for you. I think that's sufficient. Um, if VA says, well, that wasn't good enough, then I'd go get a nexus letter. But I, I, if it's in the records, that's a nexus. And these are the times when I find the compensation and pension doctors are more likely to go ahead and be approving because they already see it in the VA file. So if a VA doctor has said it, well, so that might be one thing you want to take that one page. This is my treating VA psychiatrist and bold it and hand it to the CMP doctor if you have to go to one. I'm not in favor of giving them a ton of records because then they just throw it on the table and don't look at it. But something like this, I mean, it's one sentence, and I think that could win your case for you. That's to remind us who we are. You're Shannon, I'm Carol. <laughs> oh, it's 12 o'clock. Okay, we'll do two more questions, okay? Sounds good. I had a CMP exam for my back fusion, and the doctor never did a range of motion exam, and I wasn't given an increase. What should I do? Oh! <gasps> Appeal, send a letter explaining that you weren't given a range of motion exam, that they didn't use the goniometer on you, that um, the exam, you know, took 15 minutes and they didn't even touch you or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, I'm just giving examples, but you need to give a statement about what happened during your exam and use that to appeal and ask and for a new exam. Yeah, a fusion would mean like your, your limitation of range of motion should be a lot less. I would get that CMP exam and did he give range of motions when he didn't even take them? We don't even know what they did unless you saw the CMP exam. And by the way, one of my clients after last week, one of the questions was, how do you get your CMP exams? She said that if you have, remember there are two, I don't, what's the, you can get all of your VA information online. One is your VA medical treatment and the other is your VA benefits. If you have one of the things, it gives you all of it. And she said they're clearly in there, all of your CMP exams, all of your reports. Um, I'm going to see if we can put, she did an outline of what exactly you can find. And I think I'm going to see if we can uh, post this for all of y'all to look at. But if you don't have that, please, please, please get that. You have to go to the VA to get um, a password to get you started. But this, instead of not knowing what's going on. So many times you can just look right in your own account and it tells you, okay? That's a great benefit for you. And it's not the same as what Shannon and I get. We get a totally different online access. And sometimes you get information quicker than we do and more information than we do. So that really, that's really important that you have that access. And knowing what the doctors have said about you during your CMP exam and during your, and, you know, seeing your medical records, Sometimes you think something's there because you know it and you know you said it, but Absolutely. then you look at the actual record and they have not said what you said. And so the only way you can correct that is if you know about it. So it's the knowledge is power in this situation. And you needed to get it for yourself, particularly if you have a VA treating doctor. What are they saying? I Many of my veterans will go in and they will complain, complain, and none of that shows up on the record. And if that's happening to you, you're just building a bad case against yourself. Please read your VA medical records as well as the CMP exams. Last question. Hello, explain to me this. 10% GERD, 50% headaches, 10% radiculopathy, 20 degenerative arthritis, 30 urticaria, 50% sleep apnea, and 170%, but I'm at 90 according to them. Oh, VA math. <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm going to try to make it simple. Um, they start with, let's see, if you have radiculopathy, I'm trying to see if there's any bilaterals here. And I don't know if there are just based it on says this. says 10%, thing. but we don't know if that's for both legs or one. So I'll just kind of, I'm going to just give you an example. So for instance, the headaches are 50%. So VA, this isn't how it works in the real world, but this is VA math. If you're 50% disabled, they say that you're still 50% healthy. So any additional disabilities, like your new 50% sleep apnea, that's not a 50% disability. That's 50% of the remaining healthy 50%. So it turns into a 25%. So in reality, in real life, when you add up these disabilities, they're more disabling. But the way VA looks at it is they're less disabling somehow because you have more of them. It makes zero sense in 
like it's not practical it doesn't make sense to you but they they combine them there's a chart you can find we have a calculator on our website so you can add it up and see you know make sure that they usually get the math right not always i have seen cases where they didn't but right. um, so it's it's worth checking yourself absolutely but it's it's because they don't add them they combine them and and they take this you know all your additional disabilities come out of the healthy percentage that's left and so it's it's very very difficult the higher you get it's harder and harder to get to that 100%. And that's a lot of times why unemployability is such a blessing because it's yes. just an alternate way to bump you to 100%. Right. So remember, they don't say your added rating is 90%. They say your combined rating is 90%. Well, Sharon, it was Shannon, it was a real privilege to be with you today. I always Thanks. love being with Shannon. She makes me laugh. She has these two sons that are just marvelous. <laughs> yeah, that's they're funny. I'll give you that. They're very funny. <laughs> well, have a good week. And all of you out there, have a good week. Um, win your cases. We love that. Bye.